Welcome to SATCONS 101, an educational activity of the International Astronomical Union's Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference, or CPS. This activity aims to promote factual understanding of large satellite constellations in order to help participants come to reasoned and informed opinions about this important social and technological issue. Today's topic is Satellite Basics. The Center's mission is to coordinate efforts and unify voices across the global astronomical community with regard to the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. My name is John Barentine, and I co-lead the Community Engagement Hub of CPS. My training is in optical and infrared astronomy, and my current professional work involves freelance consulting. Since 2019, I have worked on policy and advocacy issues around large satellite constellations. I will present to you on today's topic. These are the learning objectives of the SATCONS 101 curriculum. Participants will gain exposure to these ideas in the course of viewing all of the presentations in the series. Opportunities to learn more about any given topic will be offered in each module, as well as to contact the Center for further information. SATCONS 101 is a series of learning modules covering eight broad subject areas. Each module is a short, self-contained video presentation covering one of the subject areas. They can be viewed individually or in any combination up to the full set. Viewing all eight presentations constitutes exposure to the complete SATCONS 101 curriculum. Today, we will focus on the topic of satellite basics. In the next few minutes, I will discuss each of the following elements that relate to the topic of this video. The Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite into space in 1957. The earliest period in the history of spaceflight in the late 1950s consisted of tests of satellite technology. Uses of satellites then spread into the realm of communications with the launch of the Echo-1 satellite in 1960. In the same year, applications of satellite technology branched into Earth observation. The Tyros-1 satellite sent back the first television footage of weather patterns seen from space. 1964 saw the launch of SYNCOM-3, the first satellite placed into a geosynchronous orbit. This position allowed the satellite to dwell in a stationary location over a given region of the Earth. Military applications of satellites were also realized early on. For example, between 1961 and 1963, the U.S. military conducted Project West Ford, which aimed to alter the properties of the Earth's upper atmosphere. Since the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957, over 11,000 satellites have orbited the Earth. The number of active satellites increased sharply in 2019 with the arrival of the era of large satellite constellations. Previous attempts to operate satellites as communication networks involve small groups of less than about 100 objects. New uses of near-Earth space, backed by private commercial interests, envision much larger groups. Some proposed constellations would consist of tens of thousands of satellites. Such large groups are thought to be necessary to achieve high-speed connectivity across the entire Earth. This represents a model of utilizing Earth's orbital space in a manner never before attempted. Satellites and other spacecraft must operate reliably in the environment of space. It is a harsh place subject to extreme conditions. The factors include a high vacuum, energetic particle radiation, and harmful X-rays and ultraviolet light emitted by the sun. Also, a steady rain of tiny meteors from space can erode satellite materials. Spacecraft engineers must therefore design the mechanical and electronic systems of satellites to survive constant exposure for many years. In addition, the Earth's atmosphere presents a risk to satellites. Although very thin at the altitudes where satellites orbit, the atmosphere is still present. Each air molecule that collides with a satellite exerts a small force that opposes its motion. Over time, these infrequent collisions eventually slow down a satellite in its orbit, 
unless the satellite uses some of its fuel to boost itself back to the desired orbit. Absent such periodic boosts, the satellite slows and loses energy, causing the altitude of its orbit to drop. As it descends deeper into the atmosphere, the forces increase, lowering the orbit further. Eventually, a satellite reaches the lowest possible altitude and falls back to the Earth. Satellites in lower orbits, closer to the Earth's surface, will fall back to Earth much more quickly than satellites in higher orbit. When satellites fall back to the Earth, they usually burn up in the atmosphere, but sometimes larger pieces of debris may reach the Earth's surface. Collisions with large objects can damage or even destroy satellites. Although the distances between objects orbiting our planet are often large, sometimes they approach each other very closely. When the separation between objects becomes smaller than the physical size of each, a collision results. Satellites can become targets of space debris, ranging from discarded rocket stages to the products of other collisions. Direct collisions result in clouds of hundreds to thousands of pieces of new debris. As the fragments spread out along new orbits, they threaten other objects. These fragments can remain in orbit for centuries before they fall back to the Earth. Until then, they threaten many other satellites with new collisions. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the 2009 on-orbit collision between the Iridium-33 communication satellite and the defunct Russian Cosmos-2251 satellite that produced over 2,000 large debris fragments. Fourteen years after this event, at least a thousand pieces of debris are still in orbit. The most effective way we know to avoid on-orbit collisions is to curtail the generation of debris in the first place. The active disposal of spacecraft when they reach the end of their mission is now seen as a more responsible practice than leaving them behind in orbit. The Earth's gravity will cause lower orbiting satellites to demise eventually and propulsion systems can expedite a controlled return to Earth. Increasingly, materials are being employed that will dissipate when re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, further reducing risk to life and property on Earth. Higher orbiting geostationary satellites are disposed of by boosting them into higher, less useful orbits, dubbed graveyard orbits. Spacecraft at these altitudes may remain in their disposal orbits for many thousands of years. There is currently no proven technology to remove either higher orbiting satellites or the debris that they might shed. Additionally, rocket launches of higher altitude deployment missions may leave debris or large discarded hardware objects on orbit, including spent rocket bodies. Several private companies are exploring novel approaches to actively remove debris and spent spacecraft from orbit using specialized spacecraft, and several governments are supporting their development. To date, active debris removal has not been demonstrated in space. There are many reasons why people want to launch satellites into space, including those shown here. The main benefit of conducting certain activities in space has to do with the vantage point of satellites. From high over our planet, they are in the line of sight to large parts of the Earth at once. They enable almost instantaneous radio communication between distant places. This can bring broadband internet access to certain locations for the very first time. Satellites watch our weather and can warn us in advance of severe storms, saving lives. They have become indispensable sources of information during the recovery from natural disasters. Militaries use them to learn enemy capabilities and troop movements. And scientists have come to rely on satellites as sources of data for all manner of Earth science, space science, and astronomy. While all satellites have their own special capabilities, certain elements are common to each. Engineers design around the bus, which is the main body and structural component of a satellite. Electric power is usually provided by photovoltaic panels that convert sunlight to electricity. Batteries maintain the power supply when the satellite is in the shadow of the Earth. Propulsion units help to maintain the satellite's orbit and orientation with respect to Earth and radio transmitters and antennas enable communication with the ground. Excluding solar panels, most satellites are roughly the size of a small car and weigh only a few hundred kilograms. 
Satellites exist in different kinds of orbits around the Earth depending on the goals of their missions. There are many considerations that dictate the type of orbit into which a satellite is launched. The altitude of a satellite's orbit relates to its period, that is, the amount of time it takes to complete one orbit. Satellites in low Earth orbit at altitudes between 160 and 2,000 kilometers orbit the planet in only a few hours. At medium Earth orbit, from 20,000 to about 30,000 kilometers, the period is many hours in length. And at a very particular altitude of 35,786 kilometers, the orbital period becomes exactly one day. These so-called geostationary satellites stay in fixed locations about the spinning Earth. Many communications and weather satellites are placed in such geostationary orbits. Satellites in sun-synchronous orbits pass over any given point on the planet's surface at the same local time each day. And the inclination of a satellite orbit can vary from zero degrees, parallel to the equator, up to 90 degrees, passing over the Earth's poles. All of these factors determine the location, speed, and movement of satellites with respect to the ground. There are a few basic functions that all satellites must perform. For instance, they must keep their stations. This means that they must actively maneuver to maintain their orbits. This is especially true in the case of low orbits. Near the Earth, the extended upper atmosphere slows satellites and causes their orbits to drop in altitude. Active station keeping involves countering this effect to prevent satellites from falling back to Earth. Satellites must communicate with the ground and sometimes with each other. Preventing collisions between satellites involving knowing where satellites are at all times in relation to one another. Collision avoidance sometimes means that satellites must change their orbit slightly. They are also subject to the influences of the space environment. Conditions in space are unlike those on Earth, so satellites must be designed to withstand them. Adverse space weather events like solar flares can cripple or even disable satellites. Each satellite, whether or not it is part of a constellation, experiences a sequence of events that we can describe as a life cycle. It begins with the design of the satellite, which determines its purpose and the capabilities it must have in order to achieve certain goals. Some satellites go through prototyping and hardware development for many years before launch. Once the satellite is finalized, the satellite is fabricated and tested. Only then can it be launched into space. Fitted to a rocket, the satellite is propelled upward through the Earth's atmosphere until it reaches space. The choice of orbit determines the power of the rocket needed to place the satellite. When it arrives in its final orbit, referred to as its station, engineers conduct tests to determine its condition and functionality. Once it passes those tests, the satellite enters routine operations during its primary mission. Some satellites have missions defined for limited periods of time, while others may operate until they fail. Where a defined end of mission is expected, the satellite may be boosted to a very high orbit or disposed of through deliberate re-entry into the atmosphere. It is often said that space is hard, meaning that the challenge of launching spacecraft and operating them sometimes involves failure. There are a number of contingencies that engineers must consider in designing spacecraft. Concern for and attention to these contingencies make satellites more likely to survive the space environment. One of the most common failure modes is loss of control of the spacecraft. This can result from an inability to correct an object's position or its orientation. Often this results from the failure of propulsion capabilities. In turn, this can lead to a loss of station keeping, which is the process by which an object's orbit is maintained. Equipment on board spacecraft can fail, which endangers or even ends a satellite's primary mission. Volatile fuels can leak, changing a satellite's altitude or direction of motion. Fuels can often explode, as can batteries. These events may seriously damage or even destroy satellites. Engineers attempt to design satellites with these failure modes in mind. They often build in redundancy, 
such that the most common types of failure will not completely compromise the mission. Thank you for watching this presentation. For additional information about this and other subjects related to large satellite constellations and their impacts on astronomy in the space environment, contact the center at the address or visit the website shown here.